All right, so in this video, we're going to look at how gradients and level curves are related to each other. Um, this is uh, probably a more advanced uh, topic than the last time that we talked about level curves on this playlist, but um, we're going to so try to connect some of the things that we're learning to each other. And so uh, once you've learned how to calculate a gradient, you can actually use that to, sh to short circuit a little bit um, the way that you draw your level curves, particularly for very complicated graphs, because the gradient function that you come up with and the level curves are actually really closely related to each other. So the uh, level curve is basically what we refer to as um, a, a, it's the behavior of the function at a particular fixed value of, of the Z value. But it also is an isocline. It uh, an, an isoline is a point where the Z dimension is constant. And that, so that's a technical term for what we are trying to plot when we talk about level curves. And the, the gradients are actually going to allow us um, to plot those level curves without actually coming up with exact equations for them. So they can be quite complicated and we'll still be able to generate them from plotting the gradient itself. Now, these isolines are also things that you will typically encounter in like a physics class. And so making this connection between the gradient and the level curve or the gradient and the isoline are, it's going to, be very useful to you, not only in this class, but in other classes. So we're going to start with a three-dimensional function. And so this is our typical saddle curve. Um, and we talked about in the previous in a previous video how these uh, level curves uh, were essentially looking at the graph, you know, you, you do a cross section at a particular Z level and you look at it essentially from above and you see where the plane that you're setting crisscrosses the graph. And so how does that trace essentially at that, that level, that cross section come out? So if in an elliptical paraboloid, you would expect these ellipses. And if you do a cross-sectional graph, cross-section at different heights of Z for a saddle graph, you get those reciprocal functions uh, or these hyperboloids uh, that line the plane at different heights and different levels. So we're gonna see how these level curves are connected to our gradients. Uh, and again, again, for very complicated functions, then these uh, level curves and these isolines are not going to be nice functions all the time. And that doesn't matter for this technique. Now, to calculate the gradient, uh, recall that the gradient is essentially um, the set of partial derivatives applied to the function in three coordinates. So the first component of the gradient is the derivative of the function with respect to x. The second component is the derivative of the function with respect to y. And if you're in three dimensions, then the third component is the derivative of the function in z. Now, when Z, we, we know that b when the gradient is positive, uh, it's showing an increase, it's heading toward the peak of the graph. And when the gradient is negative, then it's pointing away from the peak of the graph. So an example uh, of a gradient, a, a gradient essentially creates a field in the plane. Here, we're only looking at it in two dimensions, not in the third dimension. But uh, when you're pointing away from the center, that the, the arrow of the gradient is always pointed in the direction of increase. So what this tells us is that we have these circular cross sections. Uh, we can see from the red lines here in our, in our picture, the circular cross sections these lines are generated by drawing a circle, in this case, a curve perpendicular to the gradient vectors that are being plotted. And the fact that they're pointing away from the center tells us that essentially the center of this is a bowl and we are, the, the, vec the gradient vectors are pointing upward 
out of the minimum and toward the maximum. So they are pointing away from the bottom of the bow. And it's this kind of relationship, the fact that the level curves are going to be perpendicular to the gradient that is going to allow us to plot both the gradient and then from them, the level curves. So again, the gradient is always going to be perpendicular to the point on the curve that it's that it's pointed from. If you have the, cur the vector field from the gradient itself, then you can always identify at least approximately where the level curve has to be by constantly just trying to be perpendicular to those gradient vectors. So let's look at this specific example here. Here we have a bunch of gradient vectors that are pointing toward this center. And then on the other side, we have this point here where all the vectors are pointing. It looks like a saddle graph, actually. This direction, they're pointing toward that. But on these, on this axis, they're pointing away from it. So how can we plot, number one, the level curves in order to get a picture of what this graph looks like? Well, the idea, again, is we're going to draw curves so that we try to stay as perpendicular to these gradient vectors as possible. So around these centers here, we're going to end up with essentially circles. Here, if we go this way, and then we go this way, and we go this way, we're going to get these hyperbolas around these points. So again, perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular. These are curves pointing in this direction. From this side, perpendicular, 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 perpendicular. They're going to go in this direction. And so you're going to see this changeover take place as you switch between these two points. This one, as I said, this one has some arrows going out, some arrows going in. This is a saddle point because it's increasing in this direction, but decreasing, it's increasing away in this direction. Whereas in this center here, this is um, going to be a maximum because all the gradients are pointing toward it. Now, if we look very carefully at what this graph looks like, this is our saddle point that is plotted right here. And this is the peak that is plotted over here. So if you have a 3D graphing program, you can actually go and you can plot it and you can see that this is in fact the combination of maximum and saddle point that you get from that three-dimensional surface. Now, to relate the actual level curves to this graph, Again, you'd have to fill in all of the um, the level curves from the graph using, again, the gradient as your sort of perpendicular markers. So anytime you cross an arrow, it has to be at a perpendicular, it has to be perpendicular to the arrow. And so if you do that, you can draw the, again, these circles around the peak. And then when it switches over to the saddle graph, you can see that these curves will now become these more or less hyperbola-like curves. It's not exactly symmetrical hyperbolas, but you get the idea. These hyperbola-like curves representing how the graph is approaching the saddle curve. So the level curves are here, and then they're increasing on this side, and they're decreasing going away in this direction. And as we saw with the graph above, it then goes off to very, very large values off on the side. And we see these, there's a maximum height here, but on this side, they're getting closer and closer together and they're getting higher and higher and higher as they go off the edge of the graph. Now let's look at a very specific example uh, and we'll walk our way through exactly how to plot the curves and then how to draw the level curves from there. So I chose this, uh, this should say f of x, y, this three-dimensional function. Uh, it's a cubic. It's got a cross product term. 
And we begin, I have no idea what this looks like, some kind of weird cubic. Um, so we begin first by finding the gradient. And by we take the der partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y. Now, since both of these are explicit, um, we and we're we're we have a, a it's a, it's not like a surface in three D that's not a function. This is an explicit function of z, and so we can ignore the sort of z component because it's always going to be one. Um, and we're going to plot our 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 um, our graphs in the plane, and then we're going to work directly from there. So. Uh, we're going to set each of these equal to zero to find any critical points. And the other thing that we can do is if we plot these critical, these graphs as they are, um, solving for y and then putting them into an equation um, or like Desmos or something like that, then we can see where the, what the graphs look like and how they intersect. Now, these points where the gradients are zero, sometimes these are referred to as null clines. Um, you will see other terms for them. But the idea here is that these are where the derivatives are zero. And we may have one component that's zero on a particular set of values and the other component that's zero on another set of values. And where they intersect with each other will be where we have our potential two-dimensional critical points. So they could be maxima, they could be minima, they could be saddle points. So if I solve each of these, set them equal to zero and solve, uh, the first component of my gradient becomes y equals 3x squared plus 6x. And so I get this graph right here. And then if I set the, the y derivative equal to zero, um, I'm going to get a sideways parabola um, which is again, if you're if you're in Desmos, you don't have to solve this for y. You can just put it in as an implicit function. Um, if you're trying to do this in your TI calculator where you have to solve for y, then you get this sort of messy graph. But nonetheless, you end up with this um, basically the square root graph, and then the the negative version of it to turn it into this. Um, parabola. Now, what we can see from this is that this graph, like many cubic functions, has at most four critical points. And there are, in fact, four places where this graph crosses each other. Um, we can see the approximate coordinates on the graph in each of these places where the red line and the green line cross. Now, each of these um, these lines where the one of the components is zero is essentially going to give us guidance about the general direction of the gradient function in each of these sections. And so we can actually use that sort of general, like, is it pointing up to the right or is it pointing up to the left or whatever, to sort of give us an, an idea of what the whole graph is doing without having to be quite as precise as a computer would be and plotting individual coordinate uh, gradients all across the plane. So that's the next thing that we're going to do is we're gonna basically use uh, these regions by choose a point inside, let's say this region, and I check the value of my gradient, what direction is it the gradient pointing in? And then I can use that as again, a general idea of what the gradient is doing everywhere inside this, because it can't, neither coordinate can change direction until you cross over one of these sign change lines. So again, seven regions. And so I'm gonna plot a point in each one of the regions. So if I choose the point negative 10, two, that's going to put me out here. So negative 10 and y equals two, that's this line right here. That's going to put me about right here. And this says that my, my gradient vector is positive, positive, positive in the x direction, positive in the y direction. That means it's pointing up to the right. In region two, which is up here, oh, negative 10, two is up here, sorry. Um, in region two, 
I'm going to plot negative one so that it's here and four. Again, so that's basically around here. And I'm going to plot that coordinate and that's going to give me negative 773. So notice the Y coordinate didn't change. It was the X coordinate. I crossed that red line. The sign flipped in the X direction. So negative 773 is now pointing in the positive Y direction, negative X direction. So it's pointing up to the left. And so I continue proceeding through each of these regions, region three, five, four, so five, four, that's up here. So I get positive, positive again. So this is pointing back to the right again. Region four, I plot five, zero, that's on the axis, that's clearly in between here. I get positive, negative. So positive, but negative. So it's pointing downward in this direction. Region five, negative one, zero, get on the axis, negative, negative. So that's pointing down to the left. Region six is in here, negative 10, zero. That's positive, negative, so positive, but negative, so it's pointing down to the right. And then region seven in here, negative one, negative two. And I'm getting negative one, one. And so that is negative in X, positive in Y, that's pointing up to the left. So now I've plotted all of the vectors, for instance, around, this is just zoomed in on this little section down here, just to see how they all work. Now notice what's happening. Uh, these vectors are all pointing at this critical point where the two lines cross. Pointing that gradient vectors that point, they all point toward the maximum, toward increasing slope. So the fact that they're all pointing toward this point, this critical point means that this is a maximum. In this particular graph, they are not pointing toward it and they are not pointing away from it. That means this is a saddle point. If we take the intersections at the top, so this is the portion that was up here. We zoom in on that. Then Again, we're looking at this graph and we're seeing that in this case, at this critical point, all the vectors are pointing away from that point. So that's a minimum. And then at this intersection, they're not pointing away and they're not pointing toward it. They're, this is a saddle graph. So you can see like these are going this way. These are going that way. That's going away. These are going away. But if you're here, you're going toward it to start with. So that is that toward that decrease and increase happening at the same time. And so I filled in a little bit more of the vectors just so that you can clearly see. Um, if you plot vectors along these axes, you can see they're basically vertical. These are basically horizontal. And that gives you that saddle trajectory, whereas again, this one, they're all pointing away, so that is a minimum. Now, once you have the gradients plotted, then you can think about those level curves, because remember, the level curves are going to be uh, perpendicular to all of your gradients. Now, when things get very complicated, you can, of course, um, uh, plot, fill, try to fill in more of them, especially using technology. Uh, but in just in terms of uh, like the general structure of the graph, you don't really need much more detail than this. Uh, again, you can see if you look at the graph from the side, this was our maximum and our saddle graph. And then over here was our minimum and our 
saddle point that is actually above that. Now, one of our goals um, for this exercise is to be able to take a gradient field that's been plotted for us and then turn that into a set of level curves. And so um, sometimes these plotting functions, because the vectors are very, very long, um, they will shorten them quite a bit. And so it can be a little bit harder to get the sort of uh, perpendicular um, um, sense because you don't have very long vectors, but the longer the vectors get, you have to think about the closer the lines have to be to each other, because the longer the gradient vectors are uh, in practice, especially if they're properly scaled, the steeper the increase is, whereas the increase is more shallow when the vectors are not very long. So we see that in this case, when the lines get really close together, the, the gradient vectors are actually getting quite long. And the reason they're so long out here contributes to the fact they're so short in the middle of the graph. And so these are sort of more gentle curves. And these are the really steep curves that you get when you get, for instance, a giant um, cubic function that near the zeros, near the critical points, it may behave more uh, more smoothly, but when it gets far enough away from the zero, it just blows up. Now, in this case, we're going to look at a gradient field and we're going to sketch the level curves just from the graph itself. Again, once you have a gradient, you can take your gradient to a plotting function, a vector field plotter, and then you can produce a very complete picture of what the gradient looks like rather than have to do it sort of generically from, okay, let's find the, the points and the intersections and the zeros. Um, but of course, um, depending on what your, your goal is in terms of the, the level curves, then more detail, you would need a more filled out vector field. The example that we did with just the critical points, that was a very complex vector field. And so getting all of those little individual vectors to fill up that whole field would be quite tedious. Now here we have a pre-plotted um, vector field for us. And again, the idea here is we're gonna draw the curves as though they're perpendicular to the gradients and that will give us the level curves. So again, what you would expect is like up here, you're gonna get a graph that's gonna look like this up here. It's going to look like this down here. This is our saddle point because everything is pointing away. But then over here, you're going to get circles because of everything is pointing toward the center. And so because everything is pointing is either outward from the center or inward from the circle, you're going to get relatively smooth circles or ellipses around either maxima or minima. So again, what I essentially did when I was filling this out is I just took every vector on the plane and I just drew a vertical line at the end of it. And then I tried connecting those dots. And so you can get this circular sense around this maximum where everything is pointing toward the center. But then for the saddle point, the curves are pulling you essentially away and then around the maximum. And so you get these, again, these hyperbolic like curves around the saddle point. So these are a couple of techniques that you can use. Once you uh, are able to find your partial derivatives, you can use them to create your, um, your uh, sort of at least a general idea of what your vector field is doing. And for some of these, again, technology plotted curves, you can get a very good sense of what the level curves to the function are like. And even for um, these hand-drawn cases, um, again, think about your critical points. Um, if they're maxima or minima, you're going to get circles or ellipses around them. And then those are going to transition to your hyperbola type curves uh, around the saddle point where they all look like those reciprocal function graphs.